I totally believe that uh, the gods of ancient times could actually have been aliens. Uh, I don't know if you remember the the big Mayan 2012 uh, calendar scare. Everybody thought the world was going to end, uh, and it was significant because it was actually a really good friend of mine's birthday. So we actually threw a party, you know, being stupid uh, and kind of making fun of the situation. But what happened out of that is it got me into researching uh, both the Mayans, Mesoamerica, and particularly the Aztec people uh, really came to interest me uh, because they, they had so many gods and so many deities, things that were part of their everyday culture. Uh, they had uh, a god of wine, god of fertility, god of birth, god of war, god of maize. In fact, uh, if I remember correctly, they actually had four different gods for corn. Uh, one for red corn, one for yellow corn, one for white corn, one for black corn. So they had these uh, deities that they uh, assigned to significant portions of their life. But if you look into the Aztec culture a little bit more, what's crazy about that fact is they actually had 400 celestial uh, sky. They had 400 sky gods. 400. During the day, they had 400. And then they had 400 at night. Mimics Zanakoa, if I remember the, the name correctly, these 400 sky gods just during the daylight hours, and then another 400 at night. They assigned significant values in their culture to deities, to these forces that they didn't understand, and the important things every day. Think about that, how essential corn was to their culture and just living day in and day out and surviving. And somehow they also assigned God's done not only that, but also two sky deities. Now think about that for a little bit. It makes you wonder, it makes you, if they assign value as a culture to those two things significantly, both uh, corn, fertility, birth, war, the, the highlights of life, it would be crazy to think that they would just arbitrarily assign 400 to sky gods. I totally believe that they knew something that we might not know or may have forgotten. Aztecs, Mayans, Mesoamerican cultures, this is repeated time after time after time in their storytelling. Just look at their artwork. It seems like they're trying to describe something in their own style that they can't quite understand. I, I look at these pictures, I look at this artwork that purely, clearly people labored over, put time into, and some of it appears to be feathered serpents, which of course we, we look upon and kind of don't have a modern day equivalent, I guess you could say, but some of it you look at and it's not fangs or teeth, it's what appears to me tubes, what appears to me technology, what appears to me uh, something that is foreign to their culture. You look at the art of something that is theirs, something they understand, and it's very well defined. You can d identify purses and people carrying things. But then you see these headdresses or people wearing masks in their, in their artwork, and it looks like a child kind of describing something that they don't understand completely, but it kind of looks like this. I can completely see that. I think the Aztec, Mesoamerican, the Mayan cultures knew something but didn't know how to put it down. For millennia, ancient man hunted and gathered like many animals on our planet. But something happened, something amazing. Suddenly, after thousands of generations, mankind settled down and civilization emerged. Soon humanity was ordering his own society. Creating rules and regulations, laws emerged as if from nowhere. Complex tools, art, literature, agriculture, transport and more emerged as if by magic. We looked to the stars the very heavens above us for navigation, inspiration, and to inform us of the time of day and even year. 
we built huge monuments to the gods we saw above us, to the same gods we claimed had come down to us from heaven and given us knowledge and life. A new phase in so-called evolution had begun. A new humanity had emerged. The gods were aliens. The change in humanity was genetic. The knowledge was given to the chosen few by the ancient watchers over mankind. This is their story. We have two choices. Mankind evolved over a vast period and then suddenly changed overnight from wandering bands to complex, civilized societies. Or ancient man was chosen by a visiting alien race to be genetically modified and then given immense knowledge. It may sound crazy, but both ideas may be equally so. These ancient astronauts gave humanity knowledge, religion, and culture. It was a mirror of their own mother culture. They aided in the building of huge and complex structures across the globe, from the pyramids of ancient Egypt to the stone heads of Easter Island. They aided us to worship them. Over time, our memory of these alien visitors has become our religions. The giants of the Bibles are everywhere. Many say this idea is madness, that history is known to us, that we know the course of human advancement, but these claims are wrong. There are in fact a great many gaps in the documented historical and archaeological records. These gaps can only be filled with an external explanation. There is in fact a huge amount of historical and archaeological evidence to prove that our history was created by the ancient astronauts. Artifacts that we have discovered from ancient times that simply do not fit in with the period. Artifacts beyond the capabilities of early man. Artifacts that reveal the likeness of our alien ancestors. Angels, fairies, giants, and other beings from tales of times past are folk memories of our ancestral deities. An archaeological example of these folk memories are the Dogu figurines from Japan dating back to as far as 1000 BC. There are no reasons known to have these strange humanoid depictions unless they are artistic interpretations of the ancient gods that descended from the skies. Many say that this is a new way of looking at old stories, and that is partly true. But the idea of ancient alien gods is not from the 21st century, nor is it solely from the 20th century. It dates back to the late 19th century and yet was ignored. It only started to become serious in the mid 20th century when Harold T. Wilkins proposed it seriously. In fact, it wasn't until the 1970s that scientists decided the idea needed to be clearly shot down. They did an excellent job, and by the 1980s, the very idea of ancient aliens had become a joke. And yet, in the 1960s, scientists suggested that we should take the idea of alien visitation seriously, even if as a working hypothesis. Carl Sagan stated that repeated visitations by alien cultures to planet Earth was plausible and that ancient historical narratives or fables were able to offer reliable descriptions of contact.
As an example of this idea is the story of a French explorer in the late 18th century who visited the northwest coast of America and made first contact with the Tlingit people. These people then built an oral tradition about this first contact which became legend and would be almost unrecognizable to us. The point here is that a brief contact with an alien culture is recorded by humanity, even if in oral tradition. When such contact is written down or recorded in artifacts, then the evidence becomes even stronger. The beauty of this is that there are copious amounts of such evidence from around the world, as we shall see. Take the Assyrian or Babylonian fish deity, Oannes or Dagon. Here is a prime example of an alien god from ancient times. It is a being with humanoid features but also part fish or with scales. Oannes came to the people of Sumeria and gave them vast knowledge, agriculture, mathematics, art, healing and more. Eventually this tale would be remembered in the Bible of the Christians as Jonah who was swallowed by the whale, a large fish. In the Bible, Jonah is special to the heavenly God. He is a prophet or speaker on his behalf. He is sent on a mission to pass on God's knowledge to the people. It is only by being launched from the mouth of a giant fish and landing safely on shore that Jonah could get the stupid people to listen to him. Apparently, it's perfectly okay to believe that all of this is true and yet ridiculous to believe that this is a folk memory of a very real, special, intellectual being trying to get humans to learn. The image of Jonah emerging from the mouth of the giant fish is in fact no different to the images of Oannes or half man, half fish being. It is an alien creature sent by the alien gods to impart knowledge. A great many ancient deities are part human and part beast. Historians simply believe that these are ideas of power or knowledge, anthropomorphic depictions of spirits of nature. But what if they were true depictions of humanoids that didn't quite look right to our ancestors? This indeed would explain why cultures across the globe depicted their gods in this manner. There are numerous artifacts to prove this point. There are also numerous works of art from history showing alien craft in the skies above us and even interacting with us, creating the religions we have today. We do not have to believe that our ancient monuments and artifacts were made by ancient aliens. We simply need to see that they were influenced by them. That they are mankind's ideas of the things they saw and experienced. Depictions of alien creatures with seemingly omnipotent knowledge and power. If I were to step back in time two or three thousand years, I too would appear strange and yet all-powerful to our ancestors. My knowledge could alter the course of human history. How much more powerful would be an ancient alien visiting Earth many more thousands of years before? To early man as he hunted and gathered in the woods and seas? Great monuments around the world still to this day hold secrets within them that man in the 21st century has yet to unlock. How can it be that the builders of Stonehenge four or five thousand years ago knew so much more than we do? How it could be that the great pyramids of Egypt are still holding on to their secrets? It is simple. The knowledge has been lost or it left in craft and flew back to heaven.
Gods of ancient times were very much like humans and yet different. Zeus, the high god of ancient Greece, could change shape and he was not the only one. Our religions are a direct result of ancient mankind's contact with alien visitors. Gods that could change the weather, bring fire and lightning out of the sky, make the oceans bubble, wipe out whole nations, fly across the sky in war chariots, rise from the dead, change shape, raise the dead, walk on water, command armies of flying glorious angels, and so much more. Where these ancient beings came from, we simply do not know, but they came. We can say with relative certainty that they came at least 5,000 years before Christ and probably in Sumeria, Turkey, and Africa, for it is here that civilization emerged. There is one all-encompassing being that rules them all and which has entered into every religion, fable, and myth across the globe. It has been misunderstood as a reptile by some, but the truth is that our ancestors saw this wise, all-knowing, and healing deity as a serpent. In order to understand the sheer amount of evidence there is for this ancient alien race of serpent gods, we have to look at the evidence piece by piece. In the beginning, we pointed out that mankind may very well have been genetically modified so as to be reborn. This then must lead us to the origin story of mankind and a great many of them all speak of the same thing, a serpent related origin. Let us look at the most famous of these, Adam and Eve. Remarkably, we find that both are in fact related to ancient serpent worship from their Sumerian origins, a religion that is in fact worldwide. The word Havaya is the root of Eve and means female serpent. It is connected to the same Arabic root which means both life and serpent. So Eve is the origin of life and she is a female serpent. But where did she come from? The Persians called the constellations serpents, the little Avas or Eve. This is a folk memory of the origins of the mother of mankind. Little Eve, the female serpent, came from the heavens. But what about Adam? In old Akkadian, Ad means father, and Adam was closely associated in legend with Seth, Saturn, Thoth, and Teatus, who were all serpent deities. So Adam is the father serpent of mankind. So the children of Adam and Eve must therefore also be serpents? In fact, Abel actually means serpent shining and Cain was called the son of serpents. So Adam and Eve, the progenitors of the human race, were serpents from heaven and gave birth to shining serpents. Why would this be if not to explain the origin of our species to those with the eyes to see? Maybe they've not been looking in the right place. Maybe they should look in the Bible the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and 4, states, When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the Son of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. This is extremely clear. A group called the Nephilim or sons of God were on earth and they saw the women and mated with them. What is all this about if not a written account of shining beings coming down to earth and mating? The King James Version translates Nephilim as giants Amazingly, the very idea of there being giants upon the land is not only to be found in the older texts of the Bible, they are in fact to be found across the world. 
this is clear evidence that these star men were of larger stature. Across Europe, great monuments such as Stonehenge were said by oral tradition to have been built by these giants. This makes complete sense because these monuments are from the exact period we are discussing and were observatories of the heavens. Great technological feats by ancient man indeed. These advances were made by the great shining ones, the serpent alien beings that gave rise to ancient Sumeria. Appearing out of nowhere and at least as early as the 5th millennium BC, the earliest known civilization, the Sumerians of summer in Mesopotamia, was initially a non-Semitic culture. By 3000 BC, and as a result of its sophisticated irrigated agriculture, summer flourished as a nation and developed a considerable power base through the development of its numerous city-states like Ur, Erech, Iradu, Lagash, and Kish. The Sumerians invented cuneiform writing and were way ahead of their time having advanced knowledge in music, poetry, art, mathematics, astronomy, and science. For the ancient Sumerian music was a tool that helped them describe the cosmos. In Sumerian creation myth, the angels known as the Anunnaki, Anunnaki, or great sons of Anu, were the founders of their culture. The names Angel, Ananage, and Anakim have much in common. They are indicative of the ancient alien ancestors who brought the secrets to the rest of the world. Interestingly, Anunnaki is phonetically similar to the Hebrew Anakim, the giant race, and also Ngarkak, the shaman from Greenland to Alaska. These ancient alien beings are in the Bible as angels and gods or Elohim because the Hebrews utilized the Sumerian myths when writing their own. The book of Enoch in the Bible tells us that the sons of God were in fact called watchers and numbered around 200, an elite group of beings that watched over mankind. They are said to have descended to earth and bred with humans. They had offspring and these were called Nephilim or giants. Mankind was given great knowledge by these watchers and Nephilim but eventually the Nephilim and mankind turned against each other and God stepped in. The humans who had gained the greatest knowledge, the watchers and the Nephilim were destroyed in the great flood. This knowledge imparted upon mankind was metallurgy, cosmetics, sorcery, astrology, astronomy, and meteorology. It appears that the gods were worried that mankind had become too powerful, a threat to themselves, and so with their great power they caused a flood, leaving behind only the remnant of mankind. In the Bible, the watchers are described as fallen angels. Is this one of the first ever science fiction books? Or is this a bastardized version of the history retold by the new Hebrew religion in their own book? Is this really an historical account of ancient aliens visiting the earth to observe them? Did they ignore their own orders and breed with humans? Is this the point of genetic manipulation written down as the word breeding by a non-scientific mind? If this is true, then you and I have alien blood running through our veins. In the Old Testament, chapter 1 of the book Ezekiel recounts a vision in which Ezekiel sees an immense cloud that contains fire and emits lightning and brilliant light. It continues, the center of the fire looked like a glowing metal and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. These creatures are described as winged 
and humanoid. They sped back and forth like flashes of lightning, and fire moved back and forth among the creatures. The passage goes on to describe four shiny objects, each appearing like a wheel intersecting a wheel. These objects could fly, and they moved with the creatures. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved, and when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. What on earth had Ezekiel witnessed? Probably nothing on earth at all. This is obviously an ancient man's depiction of a UFO lighting up the sky. In fact, the Bible is full to brim of alien history. There are powerful holy weapons that are capable of wiping out mankind such as the Ark of the Covenant. There are angels flying down to earth, ladders to the heavens, a Messiah rising into the sky back to the heavens, floating beings walking on water, shape-shifting, and so much more. All of this needs to be reappraised with a new outlook, an outlook of ancient alien visitation upon planet Earth. The history of mankind shall remain incomplete until we do. But there are a great many artifacts, tales, and histories outside of the Bible and from across the world which all point to a period over 7,000 years ago when we were visited by aliens from another place. There are tales of serpent deities and giants everywhere in all cultures, from oral traditions to written record, from sacred monuments to artifacts. The evidence is there by the truckload. Through fear of ridicule, historians and scientists ignore the facts right before them. Let us return to the watchers once more, for herein lies the truth. When Cain and his wife bore Enoch and built a city called Enoch, we have the people of Cain, or the son of serpents, being consecrated before God. Enoch was the son of Cain, who was the son of Adam and Eve. He was therefore himself one of the Nephilim, the sons of aliens. So many of the myths of the snake culture crossed over during the vast period that encompassed the many rising civilizations, and so many of the myths emerged within the fables, folktales, and religions of Greece, Rome, and Egypt. They took on the ideas of the earlier beliefs and fostered them, adding their own unique element. The Western mythologies then took these classical structures and built upon them further. But we can see the prevalence of the serpent culture even within the names of the various places and deities from antiquity. Eusebius is credited with announcing to the world that even the Zoroastrians called their expanse of heaven after the serpent. This is true of many cultures. The heavens was described as the place of serpents. The same serpents that originated mankind and gave him knowledge, just like the snake in the Garden of Eden. In Chaldea, the most ancient of places, the city of Opus on the Tigris is named after the serpent and it is said that the people there were addicted to the divination and worship of the serpent. The serpent worship passed on swiftly into Egypt where the deity was known initially as Kanaf, Kanef, and Senef. Later it became Ab or Ub, the royal serpent or basilisk. One of the chief deities was Vulcan, who Cicero styled as Opus, another serpent term. This was the same god as most austere Osiris, the sun god. Osiris was often known also as Abel or Pythosol, 
with great pillars of stone dedicated to his worship. These pillars became known later in Greek times as obelos or obeliscus, now seen as the obelisk and related to basilisk. They reached towards the heavens, back home where they came from, as if pointing a finger. Think about that for a moment. One of the most iconic monuments in the world is the obelisk named after the serpent deities that gave mankind the knowledge to build them and it points home. With this knowledge, a new investigation should be undertaken to work out precisely where these ancient monuments pointed in the heavens. Are these really clues left behind our ancient alien gods for us to discover when the time is right? Even modern places' names show a link with the most ancient serpent worship. Opus, Ophis, Opionia, Ophiusa, Obatha, Obana, Opichi, and many more were originators of these modern names. Ethiopia, for instance, comes from Thoth and Athoth, or a mistaken translation of Eth Ophion a sacred title for the followers of the serpent deity. Thus, it could be that Ethiopia or Ethiopia came directly from the term Aethope and Aethopis, worshippers of the snake. Even the original names for roads shows the remarkable divergence of the snake cults. A people called Kuthites or Haliadae settled on this beautiful island and they were also known as Hivites or Ophites, followers of the snake. The island was named Ophiusa. There is the oral tradition which emerges that Rhodes was once swarming with snakes. It was in fact swarming with snake followers. The modern term for Rhodes could also be from the Syriac term for serpent, Rad. The same myths are true of many places. Even Cyprus was once called Ophiusus or Opiotus, from the proliferation of serpents said to have been found here. From the mysteries of Osiris, Iris, and Horus to Atis and Cybele from Circes and Proserpine to Bonadea and Priapus, we see a remarkable association of the serpent deity in the creation of mankind. There was a great secret spread with these myths by the people of the serpent, a secret which spread across continents, then embedded into local culture, changing slowly with time into modern myths and religions. And yet, all along, they really held the truth about the origin of mankind and our knowledge and rise to great civilizations. Before even Sumerian legends, there are copious vases with gigantic snakes winding over the entire universe, sun, moon, and stars, as if the serpents commanded the heavens. The snake is found growing out of plants, chalices, and wells. It is the giver of life. The next and most widespread ancient symbol of the snake is the spiral. This is found everywhere, especially on stone monuments. The spiral is believed to be the symbol of the mother goddess, and as we shall see, this relates back to the snake just as the mother of mankind, Eve, does. If we look at the Indian Sheshnaga, or serpent god, we find that there are some researchers that have claimed him to be possibly the initiator of the Christian halo effect. There is little wonder here, for these tales not only crossed boundaries, cultures, and beliefs, they crossed continents in ships. 
There was widespread belief in the power of the serpent and the spiral images linked directly with the snake gods, thus virtually proving that the spiral is a snake symbol. It also shows that with their eye on good propaganda, they saw in the snake a wonderfully powerful association for their leader. This is not just a common modern practice like getting a celebrity to endorse a product. It was a marketing tool many years ago as well. This universal symbol of the spiral is said to be the initiator of the maze or labyrinth, which is also thought to be symbolic of the snake's path. To follow the path of the coiling snake is to follow symbolically the way to immortal life. Serpents were said to be immortal, and in all likelihood, this is because the ancient serpent alien race appeared to live forever compared to our short lifespan. We probably do have the oldest serpent symbols in the Sumerian legends. Their word for dragon or winged serpent was Yusham, and their origin can be traced back to 5000 BC in the story of Zhu. However, the Chinese also have a claim that dragons can be traced back to 5000 BC, which would not be surprising if the ancient aliens had visited Earth at that time. Is this our evidence of just when they arrived? But there are older legends, and as we shall see, these legends emerged largely from Africa probably fermenting in the growing power struggles which ensued with a growing number of people and the emerging altered civilizations being fostered by the ancient aliens. In Central Africa, the peculiar and famous Dogon people have a divine serpent called Lebe, who is the first member of the living dead. It is a serpent who has the first power to overcome actual death. He is not a man, for no man can overcome death. He is a serpent god, which has come to them from above. These Dogons still believe in Lebe, but their belief goes back to the origins of their tribe. An oral tradition, which is sometimes stronger and more believable than written texts, especially when we consider that many ancient texts have been altered and manipulated by those in power. The Christian church has been guilty of this act for hundreds of years. Indoctrinating the illiterate into their new propaganda and taking the originator's name in vain for the purpose of power. In Dahomey, the Fawn people have a great serpent who is seen as a rainbow named Don. This serpent encircles the world as the Ouroboros. Basically, there are many serpent gods in Africa with many attributes, but mainly attributes of creation, forming the universe, the stars, heavens, and the mountains, and bringing mankind as we know it into existence. Simply replace these beliefs of gods with aliens, and we are getting somewhere. In the fantastic array of Egyptian legend, there are those gods which have always stood the test of popularity. One of these is Osiris, who, it was said, entered the tail of the great serpent, was drawn through its body, and came out the mouth, born anew. The tail is the beginning, and the head being the new life. This is a graphical tale of the spiral or maze element we found in early archaeology. Following the spiral or walking the maze is seen as the virtual walking into immortality. By the power of the snake and the Osiris myth is proof that resurrection is possible, but only through the power of the serpent. Did the aliens then have the power to bring man back from the dead like the fictional tales in Stargate? Another great and powerful name in the Egyptian pantheon has to be Isis. 
sacred snakes were said to have lived in the temples of Isis and gave oracles. Just replace sacred snake with aliens and we have powerful beings able to offer up wise counsel and predict the future. It was believed that horrendous disasters would befall Egypt if the snakes ever decided to leave. The great powerful queen goddess Isis was given power over the poison of the serpent and the scorpion. In one text, Isis lays her hands on a poison child and casts out the poison. Egypt's mother of creation, Per Uachit, was also a serpent. The hieroglyphic snake stood for goddess and eventually Uraeus, later to become one of the secret names for God in medieval alchemy, a subtle allusion to God being both male and yet female. This Egyptian Uraeus or Asp was a guardian god of the Delta region. It is the name for the snake which is seen on the foreheads of pharaohs. It is the Egyptian cobra and was said to be the snake Cleopatra chose to use when committing suicide. It would be the bite of the asp which would lead her into eternal life. This is how it was seen, not as terrible and wasteful suicide as we would see it today, but a stealing of her soul from those who would oppress her and deliver her up to life immortal in the other world. Take all of this now and turn it towards the ancient aliens. We have the power of the serpent giving the queen the ability to travel to the other world, a world where the gods lived. This is the immortality that the serpent can bring. This journey of discovery becomes ever more exciting when we see things like this clearly and old stories are not only brought back to life but are given a new dimension. Suddenly, fanciful ideas become the foundation of a whole new history of the world. That story people have retold for generations are in fact vessels of hidden knowledge and that we are the ones who can now see the truth revealed for the first time. There are many more forms of serpent deity within the pantheon of Egyptian lords with many attributes and we really do not need to go through them all. But there is one Egyptian god which moved away from his origin and is now found in our Western Christian world as Satan. And remember, Satan is mixed with Lucifer the light bearer that fell to earth. One of the attributes of the Egyptian Set was the serpent and as Set Hen he became Satan when the Hebrews immigrated. No wonder then that the image of Satan is and has been seen as the snake. Now think about an alien creature when you hear the attributes of this remarkable being. Set, an important god, was able to glide over the ground silently observing human life. He embodied immortality. He was the son of the earth being reborn each day from the womb of the great mother. He was the consort of the goddess Setet, which is said again and again to have eventually evolved into the very biblical tempter of Eve. Set later appeared in Russian folklore as Koshki, the Deathless, moving on to become the dragon that must be slain to receive immortal life. All of this is pure alien science fiction. Ra, probably the most famous of all Egyptian gods, was the sun god, and as the serpent, he is associated in male form as the sun. Ra tamed the serpent and according to the Egyptian magical texts, he put the serpent in chains. A special liquid was produced by Ra, which would enable eternal youth. 
It was held in a sacred vase and said to be the most secret liquid. The great and powerful Ra, the sun and snake god, tamed the serpent and produced a magical liquid which not only bestows immortality, but is kept in a sacred vase. Does this reveal that the very tales of the Holy Grail itself could be in fact linked to some amazing science brought to us by ancient aliens? But what of Greece? The Greeks had many terms for snakes, such as Aspens, Dracon, Agnida, Herpeton, and Ophis. Kraken is also a powerful Greek serpent, this time of the sea. K-R is Sanskrit for creator, and this kind of etymology must show the powerful links between the various cultures of the ancient world and the fact that all cultures saw the ancient alien serpent breed to have been creators of mankind. A Karakan means great fire or light or great one. Egyptian mythology states, Aker keepeth ward over the wicked. The great light watched over the ordinary people, the humans. The same root word gives us Cerebus, the three-headed serpent dog which guards Hades or the other world. Ichthus, the secret name of Jesus, is claimed by most entomologists to be the same as Iacus or Bacchus, and as Longfell Beatty points out in The Garden of the Golden Flower, Bacchus bore the same mystery name as Jesus, Ichthus, the fish. Bacchus was the son of Zeus and is the same as Dionysus, who was born as a serpent and represented as a bearded man crowned with a vine and ivy, which are two plants associated with the serpent. Bacchus is a serpent god. The sign of the serpent was Ichthus, which strangely became a fish when taken by a new messiah, Jesus. This is basically the same imagery as Oannes or Jonah as we have already seen. Bacchus is also and strangely the guardian spirit of Islam. According to Midas, Bacchus possessed the philosopher's stone, that is, he could turn water into wine or give new life, and indeed it was Bacchus who gave Midas the golden touch, a gift both wonderful and deadly, like the snake, and we should remember that gold was the symbol for immortality. So we may have here, in the story of King Midas, a subtle lesson. The golden touch of Midas was both wonderful and yet deadly. One had to use it sparingly, and it symbolically pointed towards immortality bestowed upon Midas by a serpent deity. Again, amazing power of life creating and life resurrecting bestowed by an ancient and mysterious serpent group of deities that came down from the heavens. But there is yet more in the Greek mystery plays and traditions which is of interest to us. There is an interesting staff, similar to the caduceus, called the thyros. This is entwined with the vine or ivy, which we know to be symbolic of immortality and the serpent. It is surmounted with a pine cone, which signifies immortality. This staff is the life force, like the Indian Kundalini, and is chiefly associated with Bacchus and Dionysus, but it is also found in Egypt, Phoenicia, and among the Hebrews. Is this powerful staff symbol a folk memory of an amazing piece of alien technology? A rod of the gods. 
we have found that there are mythological and legendary links between all the messianic deities and now this is a symbolic link. All the saviors from classical and Hebraic literature are there simply to bring us knowledge and eternal life and their tool is the serpent. In fact, this amazing life-giving device would become a symbol of power and life for generations and is still with us to this day in the form of the cross. The asp or sacred horned serpent of the ancients was alternatively known as the serastus. The word seras is the equivalent of cross and in Greek the word charis means horn. In Hebrew, serastus might be rendered great beloved like Jesus. Jesus, as we know, was seen upon the cross or seras with the crown of thorns or horns and this image strongly associates itself with all the images of the horned serpent. Only through the serpent may we have eternal life. Only through their power may we too rise up to the heavens. Through the alien serpent we may have access to the ancient gods. The Greek god Ophiuchus, which means he who holds the serpent, came to represent Asclepius, the ancient healer now seen in the stars because that is where he returned. But what about the greatest of Greek gods, I asked myself. Surely he would show some signs that related him in some way to this ancient truth. I did not have to search far. Although Zeus, as the father of Greek pantheon, is never depicted with serpents, he is, when in the form of the Olympian Zeus, Mylikios, who takes on the form of a serpent to attend the spring rites of the mother goddess Earth. Indeed, Zeus actually took the form of the serpent, Ophion, to avoid the ravages of his father Kronos, or time. He thus avoided what we all fear, time catching up on us, death, but he needed to live longer than his humanoid state. Again, we have evidence of ancient gods shape-shifting and here we discover why. The physiology of the ancient race enabled longer lives. Ours seemed trapped into a specific timetable, whether by accident or design. Zeus also utilized his own angels. The Greek daemons would later become Christian demons and which were invisible beings assigned by Zeus as guardian spirits to guide and give wise counsel. They appeared as handsome youths or wise serpents. This greatest of Greek gods utilized the snake to avoid death and to bestow wisdom. Although we know in today's age that Zeus was not real, we do know that these myths and legends were created or adapted in order to make certain points as folk memories of a very real period of contact with alien species. Many times they are to teach us how to live, how to relate to others. We cannot therefore ignore what these stories are telling us we must see that hidden somewhere within them are truths in their own right. There is little wonder that the name serpent is related to wisdom, the wise serpent of the Bible, the same that Moses lifted up in the wilderness, the same wise serpent equated with Jesus himself. The snake became symbolic for wisdom and for the female aspect and was no more powerful than in the image of Sophia.
Obviously, as Ophis is serpent, so too is Sophia, and which now means wisdom. And we find in most of the world's folklore that the snake is equated to wisdom, even in the Bible. There is little wonder that this should be the case if mankind ever saw the serpent-like humanoid aliens as serpents, because they were indeed wise. It cannot be that the humble snake was seen as wise. The question is, why did the ancient alien gods come to Earth, genetically alter the human race, and teach them? Were they looking for worshippers? Would a superior race really desire such a thing? Or were they looking for slaves? Or are we seeing this a too human way? Are we able to reason their motives? Some have said the aliens needed slaves to mine for gold. But modern science has discovered that gold is everywhere in the universe and easily available from meteors and other objects in space. Why would they come light years to collect gold? I suggest a new theory and one that relates to all that has been said. The one main thing that comes up again and again and again is immortality. Could it be that our ancient alien race were dying? Could it be that they needed new genetic stock to breed with or possess? Today, scientists believe that the ancient astronaut hypothesis is actually not wrong and may in fact be true, but they have as yet to discover evidence. Enoch was the consecrated one because he was of their blood. He would later write up the history of these fallen wanderers who spread across the globe as the great shining ones. teaching, measuring, and building the world's most mysterious ancient monuments. Of course, we must not forget the seraphim of Numbers 21.6 and elsewhere. These are not mystical beings. They have hands, face, legs, but do they have powers from God? Because they are in the light, and they have the symbolic wings of the early shaman, the bird flight, the Dreamtime Trance ability to fly. Their name means Shining Ones or Fiery Serpents. They are enlightened beings via the power of the serpent. Mystical Jewish literature tells us that the angels can fly, tell the future, shapeshift, speak Hebrew, and are the emanations of the divine shining light. They are aliens. In the Old Testament, God is indistinguishable from the angel or messenger known as Yahweh. He looks the same and acts as his representative. There is no difference here from Babylonian, Egyptian, and Sumeria. These are all the same beings interpreted through different cultures. In the New Testament, the angels actually take part in the judgment at the end times. This is from the idea that they will one day return like the film, the day the earth stood still. We are told that the Nephilim, or Watchers, are the angels who seem to have been the military arm of the Shining Ones and who were initially employed to guard the Garden of Eden. then began to mix with the indigenous peoples of the area. This Garden of Eden is where the genetic manipulating was taking place. High above the rest of mankind, Eden means plateau. And it came to pass when the children of men had manipulated that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come. Let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Samjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, 
Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecautions not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecautions upon it. Book of Enoch. From this union, a hybrid race was produced, a race of giants, so we're told. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and they began to go in unto them, and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments, and the cutting of roots, and made them acquainted with the plants. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants whose height was three thousand ells, who consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. And then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from the heavens and saw much blood being shed upon the earth and all lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. These insurgents also passed on knowledge and taught them combat and how to make weapons. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Simjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Aramos the resolving of enchantments. Barakijal taught astrology. Cocobel, the constellations. Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds. Ariquiel, the sign of the earth. Shamsil, the sign of the sun. And Sareel, the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. All this was seen as a violation against the set of laws laid down by the aliens who were possessive of their knowledge. Thou seest what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn, and Simjaza to whom thou hast given authority to bear rule over his associates. And they have gone to the daughters of men upon earth and have slept with the women and have defiled themselves and revealed them to all kinds of sins and the women have borne giants. Enoch, a scribe, who is the son of and taught by the alien Shining Ones, was then employed as a messenger or intermediary between the Shining Ones and these Fallen Ones, who had decided to abandon their divinity to live amongst the tribes of man. Enoch, was then sent to tell the insurgents that a severe sentence had been passed on them and that they were soon to be punished. A brief punishment sent is the flood. It is as if the Shining Ones wanted to wash away the sins of the earth that had been created by their own kind, the Fallen Ones. What we have to ask now is one very simple question. If it is true that these aliens will one day return to make judgment upon us, then are we ready? In what form will that judgment come? The fact is that we children of men and alien have indeed failed miserably. We have caused suffering in the name of religions these aliens originated we caused suffering in the name of just about anything. We've raped and pillaged our Mother Earth so badly that we have eradicated species and altered the environment itself. Every day, mankind commits atrocities. 
Ask yourself now, if you were a wise serpent alien with vast knowledge and power, what judgment would you make upon the people of planet Earth?